I'd like to share with you a few stories now about John's personal life. We heard a lot about his scientific and leadership uh, uh, career. I'll talk to you a little bit about John as a husband, family man, as a person. John had two passionate loves in his life, his family and his work. He had many other loves, like Hebrew and literature and so on, but those were really his passions. And he was fortunate to live all his life surrounded by these loves. Let me start with a story of how we met, which uh, John loved this story, and some of you heard it already. We met 40 years ago. I was a young physics graduate student at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. John was a young faculty member at Caltech at that time. He came to Israel the first time uh, ever uh, for a one-week trip and gave lectures at various places. He saw me at the Weizmann Institute. I came to his lecture. He saw me at the, at the hallways. And the way he said, he said, well, I saw, I saw you, and I, saw what I, and, and I liked what I saw. <laughs> and he asked my advisor, Gabby Goldring, uh, to introduce us, which he did. I was then uh, putting some experiment together on an accelerator. I, as was customary, as a graduate student, having a famous young visitor from the United States, I showed him around the lab, I showed him my experiment. I've done it many times before with other visitors. But at the end of the tour that I gave him, he asked me for a date. <laughs> that was new to me. I told him I was very busy with my experiments, which I was for the next few days, that I had to stay there in the evenings and at night and, and so on. But as you know, John never took no for an answer. And he kept calling probably a dozen times each day for the next couple of days. He called me at home, my mother was home, and she told me, this young fellow called, he didn't speak any Hebrew, and I don't speak too much English, I don't know what he wanted, but he kept asking for you. <laughs> so finally, I talked to him after about a dozen times that he calls, and we went out, and uh, it was love at first date. Uh, we went, the first uh, time we met, we, we, on our first date, I remember we went to the old Opera House in Tel Aviv, which was a beautiful old building right on Medi the Mediterranean. We went for a beautiful walk along the Mediterranean that uh, evening, and we fell in love, and it continued for 40 years and more. Then after the end of the week, so we spent a week together while he was in Israel. We toured the country. We had fun. We enjoyed each other immensely, even though I did not speak much English, and he did not speak any Hebrew at that time. But the language of love doesn't need too much words, although we did speak in some of my broken English then. And then he went back to Caltech, of course, and we corresponded by, by mail. And uh, he uh, asked me to come and visit, spend some time at Caltech in the United States, and I said, no, maybe you come here. I don't want to, to leave Israel. And then to my surprise, one day I find a letter in the mail, and inside was a round-trip ticket to fly to California and uh, visit at Caltech. That was a pretty amazing thing to do 40 years ago. First of all, flying from Israel to, to the United States 40 years ago was almost like flying to the moon today. People didn't do it very easily. Also, John was starting as a young assistant professor. He probably spent his last pennies on this round trip ticket. So it was a gutsy and risky thing for him to do. And his friend John Faulkner, who was with him at that time, can tell you more about it. But I decided to go. I loved that young man. And uh, I also thought it's probably my only opportunity ever to go and visit the United States and see the world outside of Israel. So I spent a few weeks at, at Caltech. Uh, we had a wonderful time. We talked and we traveled and we worked and uh, we were deeply in love. John uh, proposed and I'll keep, we have a nice continuation of that, but, but the time is running short, so uh, I'll keep it short. 
we decided to, to get married. Uh, we got married at Caltech, uh, and we've been together uh, for 40, 40 years. This story shows what many people mentioned already in his scientific career and, 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 and elsewhere, his tremendous persistence. He would never take no for an, uh, 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 an answer. He would not stumble on any obstacle. He will jump right over it and figure out a way to solve it. He was always very goal-oriented. He always knew what he wanted and he went for it. He ha was full of dedication. He was full of passion. That's how, it worked, how he worked in his personal life. That's what he did with solar neutrinos, with the Hubble, and with many of the other things that we heard about. Let me tell you another couple of stories that illustrate the same qualities in John. Stories from his high school years in Shreveport, Louisiana. One is about his tennis, one is about the, about the uh, debate team. In, sh in his high school in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, sports was a big thing. I don't know how much academics was, was regarded, but sport was regarded highly. Tennis was particularly nice, and John liked tennis, although he never played, and he decided he wanted to get into tennis. So in his second year in high school, he started working on his tennis, uh, tennis game. A, f a good friend of, of him from high school, who was on the tennis team and a good f remained good friends with us, describes it to me very nicely. He said, he saw John on the tennis, jo so John worked very hard, John joined the tennis team, and, he said, and the friend tells me, John, John was quite good at tennis, even though he taught it all himself, never played before. But he was kind of awkward playing when he first started. But he worked extremely hard. He said, he ne the friend tells me, he never saw anybody being so persistent, so hardworking, so methodical in trying to teach himself some new skills, some new profession. And John was passion getting passionate about tennis, just like he was passionate about anything he put his mind on. The second year he was on the tennis uh, uh, team, and he was playing so much better. And uh, the friend said there was no surprise to him that in the third year as a senior, John was not only a star of the tennis team, but he won the state championship, championship of tennis of Louisiana. And he became a state champion and continued playing tennis for many years until maybe a few years, 10 years ago or so. Again, it was the, his dedication, his persistence, his goal-oriented method. And the friend told me something slightly different than what, what our friend Norm was just saying. The friend said he knew then that John will reach very high just because of his enormous persistence and in his enormous dedication and, and his, his uh, seriousness of purpose. A similar story is about the debate team. In his last year of high school, senior year, John decided to, to join the debate team, the high school debate team. He never did debating before. He read about it, he practiced it, he studied it, he joined the debate team, and he had two other uh, students who remain close friends to today. They are both in, still in Louisiana, in New Orleans, so one is a judge, one is a well-known lawyer there. And that year that John uh, joined the debate team, he became the national debate team champion of the entire United States. First time ever and probably the last time that a team from Shreveport, Louisiana <laughs> has won the national debate team. For anyone here who has ever tried to debate John, <laughs> knows that you had no chance. I never tried. He was just very good at debate. And again, it's the same qualities that got him there. 
his Hebrew, and I think uh, Freeman mentioned his Hebrew uh, studies. John did not speak hardly any word of Hebrew, maybe a few words, shalom, or, or you know, a few words like that. After we were married, he decided he wants to study Hebrew because it was fun, because when we traveled to Israel, he wanted to know what all the family and everybody else was talking about. And he taught himself Hebrew. I may have helped a little bit, maybe my mother helped a little bit, but not really that much. He taught himself the language, and he was passionate about it. He was dedicated. He would go with a Hebrew book. He got to a stage where he not only taught himself to speak Hebrew, but he, loved, he taught himself to read Hebrew, and he loved reading Hebrew novels. It was, he was passionate about it. Any of you who have seen him, he always walks with a Hebrew book in his hand and a Hebrew English dictionary in the other hand when he doesn't know some words to translate it. Uh, he kept reading Hebrew every day, every night before going to bed. It was Hebrew reading time. If I was ever watching CNN, I had to turn it down so John can read his Hebrew books. And he was reading it all the way. He was passionate about it. He loved literature. He loved Hebrew. He loved poetry. Those are many aspects in addition to everything that you have read about, heard about his science and family and, uh, and, and leadership. Another hallmark of John was his, as you all know, just sweeping energy, his drive, his love of life and living, his humor, his mischievousness. He liked to play games. He was very young at heart. He always played games. As his old friend Jerry Wasserberg from Caltech said, he was, John was the dynamo of the Institute. He brought energy and excitement any place he went. He loved people, he loved new ideas, he loved competition. There are many stories I can tell, but I don't have time, so let me just give you just a glimpses. Many of you who have been to our house may have seen there are those little yellow post-it notes that you're familiar with. I would find many times when I would come home from a trip or from work, little post-it notes all over the place, on the door, on the mirror, inside the refrigerator, with statements, I love you. You are the best wife ever. <laughs> just all over the place, anytime, just for fun. We have all those post-it notes, and they are fun to look and read. Similar thing he would do, he would call me during the day many times. I work at the university, he of course here at the institute. The phone would ring in the office, I'll pick up the phone and all I'll hear, I love you, and hang up the phone. <laughs> and then he calls back a minute later and said, oh correction, I love you very, very much, and hang up the phone. <laughs> Various of those things. Several of those messages are on the phone, and if I was not there, he would leave such a message on the answering machine. Several of these messages are on the answering machine, and our son then put it into the computer. So I have these phone calls now that remained with me forever. Anytime I want, I just click on the computer, and I hear, I love you, no correction, I love you very, very much. And it's there for, for me and all of us to hear. As Frank Shu said, John's famous calls, loud calls in, in Raw, in, in the corridors, calling all his group of postdocs for coffee, for lunch. John would come home and I hear the garage door closes and I would hear, Neta, I'm home. <laughs> oh, your darling husband is home. He would do the same things at home. He just enjoyed fun. He always liked new path. He took new directions. We heard about his courage. He heard about the vision. You will hear when we finish a short uh, final uh, interview that he had where he discusses him, himself, his very unorthodox, unstandard uh, way of getting into physics. It was a, a totally uh, a new path that he took. Uh, usually untraveled before, he got into physics without taking a single 
science or math uh, course in high school because she was always excused to play tennis there. So he never took a science course, he never took a math course, and he majored in physics at Berkeley, and I will let him tell you the story. Uh, but he did those, took new paths in many different angles, including the Hubble telescope that you heard, solar neutrinos, and so on. And a quote that I read before a few we uh, weekends ago here uh, that, that really fits quite tribute is the following. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And that's something that fits John quite well. He was very passionate about integrity, honesty, setting the highest standards. He demanded that from everybody who worked with him. There were interviews with him of people who said that they will come and talk to him and if he felt that they were either didn't, were not well prepared for the interview or were not presenting things in the right way, he would get up and say, well, I think this interview is finished. You may want to go uh, home and uh, redo it and I'll, when you do your homework well, we will interview again. He demanded excellence from everybody. Uh, he sought it himself, succeeded in it, and wanted everybody to do the same because that was uh, what he thought the only thing to live with honesty and excellence. Our 40 years together were the best, most joyous years of our lives. We were best friends. We were scientific colleagues. We were the love of each other's lives. I could not have imagined a better life or a better husband. We had so much fun together, working, playing, sharing, and enjoying every minute. We also collaborated on three wonderful children, Safi, Dan, and Orly, and you will meet them soon. We are all, both so proud of them, of who they are and all their achievements. As many of you know, John was enormously happy and satisfied with, with his uh, life. He loved his work and his family passionately. He had many other passion, passions that I try to mention some of them. He always did what he enjoyed doing most and he did it all the way to the end. He, that's how he would have liked to go, doing what he loved doing most, most. He worked to the end. He was surrounded with a family to the end. That's what he would like. He died very peacefully in his sleep. He didn't suffer. And at least we see that as a silver lining in, uh, in everything. He frequently said, that his life exceeded his wildest expectations. Many year, for many years he would say, if anything happens to me tomorrow, please all know that I lived just incredibly wonderfully. I never had the right to expect as much fun in my life as I did. I was fortunate with my work, with the love for my work, with my science, with the love for the institute and the colleagues here, for the family, and for the 40 years together. Some friends tell me when I say, well, we could have had another 10 or 20 years, he said, well, you can think of John as living at least three times his age, which means over 200 years, just from how much he managed to pack in to his life, how much he has managed to do on so many different topics, on so many different things. Some of you asked me today, how could he have done it all? Uh, he was enormously efficient. He just did everything quickly and efficiently and with love. John will always be with us. His contributions to science, to solar neutrinos, to the Hubble, to the Institute, to the extended family of hundreds of postdocs, those will remain forever. For me, John will always continue to be my best friend, the love of my life. Let me read a short poem. 
our life was made in heaven, full of love and care and joy. We worked, we shared, we played. We could not have asked for more. You are my best companion. You are my best of friends. Your smile, your hugs, your passion, our love will always stay. Okay, now uh, I would like, I think, only. <laughs> I'd like Orly will speak, and while Orly is uh, uh, walking up, let me just say, as a proud mother, I'll just tell you about our three children. I cannot resist that. Okay, just give me a second. <laughs> uh, our older son, uh, Dr. Safi Bakol, is a physicist. He is president and CEO of a biotechnology company, uh, Sinta Pharmaceuticals that works in the research and discovery of cancer and autoimmune uh, disease uh, drugs, uh, and they are doing well, and let's hope they will do well for everybody's sake and find some, some cures. Our son, second son, Dr. Dan Bacall, is a cognitive psychologist, uh, and he's at Berkeley. And our daughter here, our lovely daughter, Dr. Orly Bacall, is a biologist. She is a science editor for Nature Genetics uh, in New York. Orly. Thank you, Mother, for that unbiased introduction. <laughs> and I want to take a moment to thank all of you again for coming today for the really wonderful tributes that you shared, for the very special stories you shared about my father. It's really meant a lot to us. And thank you also everyone who's helped out with this program and who sent messages to us over the past couple months. Many of you have already attested today to how my father has been not only a great man, but a great family man. Some of you who know our family will also remember the great joy my father had in finally having a daughter. <laughs> After two failed attempts. <laughs> but you'll hear from both of them <laughs> shortly. Those of you here at the Institute may also remember me through the years growing up as I ran around these halls, as I came to tea time to steal cookies, and as Ari mentioned, as I drew on my father's blackboard. And when I left him drawings, he would section them off and have big notes to make sure no secretary or no eager postdoc would erase these important notes. And they stayed there for, I think, more than 10 years. I think I've also, in talking to you, I've realized I've interrupted many of your meetings with my father. And I apologize for that. He made sure to put every phone call through, no matter how important the meeting. So you'll be not surprised to hear of my close relationship with my father, of my love, admiration, pride of my father, and how blessed I feel to be part of the Bacall family. A friend asked me this week what I'll miss most about my father. I didn't know how to begin or how to explain. There was his constant sport, his guidance, his upbeat spirit, his energy, and zest for life. And as Jim said earlier, there is an endless supply of hugs. But then I realized I had to save Friday nights. Every Friday night since I graduated from high school and began my own adult life out there in the real world, he has called me every Friday night to wish me a good, a good Sabbath. For me, that time was important as a transition from the business of the week to the restfulness and reflection of the Sabbath and the weekend. And because he realized this, or because that was the only time I was home, and this was before the age of cell phones, he started calling me every Friday night. And no matter where I was, as I traveled the world and had my own adventures, he would find a way to track me down, and I knew he would call. 
And when I answered, he would know just from how I said hello exactly where I was and how to respond. There are weeks I had really exciting news to share, and he would eagerly listen and share in my joy. There are weeks I had the biggest crisis ever in the world, and he would listen, and he would help me through that. He would talk me through options. He taught me how to make his famous pro-con list, and he would help me decide how to proceed. There are weeks I would quickly whisper in Hebrew, and he knew I was busy with friends. There were some weeks I just couldn't share, and he would just wish me a Shabbat Shalom and wish me peace. From the way I said hello, he had just the right reply to any of these. He understood and he was understanding with all those fortunate enough to share in his life. Over the past 11 years, my life has been marked by these Friday night talks. They showed me how to have a close relationship and the strength and beauty relationships can bring. Every Friday night, the sunset is sweet, and as I kindle the Sabbath candles, I feel joy. I know this is my special time that is promised to share, to connect with my Father. My Father told me that what he admired most about me was my conviction and passion, and that he trusted I would find my own way in life. Whenever I took a decision that might seem to him off the beaten track, he knew this was the right choice for me. Whatever my father said he saw in me, I knew when he told me that this is reflected so well in him. I'm sure all of us today know how well this describes my father. He led his life with conviction and passion. He never feared tough decisions. He put together all of the uh, videos, uh, the sounds, the musics. He figured it out. No one else in the family and many IT professionals that we talked to couldn't figure out how to do it. So thanks, Don, for all that work and all the organizing and helping take care of everything over the last uh, two months that you did. We really all very, very much appreciate it. <laughs> when I was... Um, about 13 or 14, I asked, uh, I asked my dad, like probably a lot of kids do, what was I like when I was a baby? What was I like when I was uh, much younger? And I remember he said right away, well, Safi, I wasn't really that interested in talking in to you until you were old enough to play tennis. <laughs> <clears throat> and it was like uh, Jim Peebles said earlier today, my dad was always uh, very forthright and very, uh, very direct in all, in all situations. Um, the last uh, several months has been, of course, an incredibly uh, painful experience. But in many ways, it's also been a very amazing experience, especially for me, uh, my brother, and my sister. As we've heard from, I would say, hundreds of people, probably close to 300 people came through our house uh, the first few days uh, of Shiva. Uh, and my mother asked each of them to get up and uh, share a story of, uh, of something they remembered uh, about my dad. And even though I've known my father 37 years and um, know many of you quite well and everything he's done, it was just amazing to hear how many people he's influenced. Um, it was incredible. And we learned, all of us, my brother, uh, my sister and I, uh, many new things about our dad that in some ways I wish I could ask him about or share with him, but I'm very, very glad for that experience and for all of you that came and shared those stories uh, with us. And this morning uh, and yesterday I thought about what it is that I've heard from all of you and what it is uh, that I've learned uh, from my father, which is many things. And I wrote down um, I wrote down four things in particular uh, that really stand out to me. One visitor who came to our house uh, during Shiva was, uh, uh, is a very well-known writer who's written a lot about science and scientists, and I, uh, I actually had no idea that my father uh, knew him. And he got up and he uh, actually started crying, 
and he said uh, what he remembered most about my father was his, and these were his direct words, his, quote, almost unfathomable integrity. I've thought a lot about, as I've heard from many, many of my father's uh, former postdocs and colleagues, many of whom are, are here, uh, many of whom sent notes, what it is that uh, helped my father build such an incredible group and create such an incredible legacy. And that's definitely one of them. The core of it was really the trust uh, that he inspired in the people uh, around him and that the community had in him. And the core of that trust was a certain kind of integrity, a commitment to always uh, say what he means, to always speak the truth, and to always do the right thing. And especially as I left the academic world and went outside it, I've realized just how rare that is and how important that is and how valuable that is. And that may be one of the most important things uh, I've learned from my father uh, and I hope will make uh, me a better person and is something that I would pass down through my family. A second thing, as I also thought about what it is that allowed him to build such an amazing group and have so many people that he touched and influenced, was how to really care about people. My father valued, as all of you know, uh, truth, commitment, dedication, hard work. But there are many scientists that value all of these. And it's really hard, I think, to, especially in a field that values individual contribution and individual success and individual originality and creativity, to really, truly, deeply care about the people around you, about the lives, about the careers, about the families of your students and your colleagues. And almost every single person that stood up at our house during Shiva or many of the people who stood up here or at the 75th IAS uh, celebration who talked about my father, it was extremely clear that he touched them deeply because he had clearly cared about what happened to them. So I would say that's the second thing that really I've learned from my father uh, and I hope to I continue and do in my own life and pass on my own family. Third thing, I do some work uh, now with a person who has had in a completely different field uh, some remarkable parallels with my father's career. Judah Folkman is a physician scientist at Children's Hospital in Boston who 35 years ago came up with an idea that tumors require the formation of blood vessels to feed them and to grow. That field is now called angiogenesis, and there were three conferences last week just in the Northeast alone on that field. It's grown uh, enormously. And at the same time, he came up with the idea that one way to fight cancer would be to develop drugs that cut off that blood supply uh, to tumors. He worked for more than 33 years on this controversial idea, far outside the mainstream of science and medicine, where most people really didn't believe that he was right and thought that uh, uh, thought that it was um, unlikely to be proved correct and, and questioned his methods and his results. Two years ago, there was stunning, definitive medical validation beyond all statistical proof of doubt that his ideas are right. Drugs that, a specific drug and then later several other drugs that cut off the blood supply of tumors were shown to extend human life. He persisted for three decades and was proved right, just as my father showed incredible persistence in solar neutrinos. But what has struck me most about working closely with Judah and has reminded me a lot about my father, Judah is in his 70s, and he shows the enthusiasm and love for science and new ideas of a 12-year-old boy. He's full of wonder, excitement, and energy. And I really do think there are two kinds of scientists they're the kinds of scientists who eventually get somewhat burned out with their field or tired and eventually have a decline in interest in what they're doing and look for other things. And then there's the very rare subset who maintain continuously with no decline an incredible energy and enthusiasm and a love for what they're doing, the enthusiasm and wonder of science and new ideas of a 12-year-old boy. And my father had that. I'm not quite sure how we did that or how we figured that out, but that's one thing I hope someday to figure out as well. And I want to mention a final thing 
and that's about picking a wife. As some of you may know, I'm still uh, working on that one, <laughs> starting with getting a date. <laughs> and I, uh, I wanted to share with you just one story. When I was uh, at Stanford getting my PhD, I began working with a physicist who was just getting to know me. And he uh, came back from some meeting, and he called me into his office, and he said, you know, I met your mother at, uh, at a recent uh, scientific uh, meeting. And uh, he sort of paused, and he said, I'm trying to think of how to describe her. She's really quite aristocratic, almost, very sophisticated, classy, and um, polished. And he looked at me, and he kind of just paused and just looked at me, and he said, you know, I, I haven't met your father, but knowing you, having met your mother, and if you're the mean between your father and your mother, <laughs> Your dad must have been born in a barn. <laughs> My dad uh, loved that story. He liked to retell it often. And he loved my mother and had one of the most amazing, uh, close, and loving uh, marriages and life partnerships I've ever seen. <clears throat> when my uh, father was sick, my mother never left his bedside. Continuously for almost two months, she slept on chairs. She always found a way to never leave him. It was uh, unbelievable. You've been incredible and a real inspiration to all of us. Thanks, Neta. <clears throat> so as I said, the last six months has been a very painful experience. And uh, it's as if, in some sense, a piece of your soul is torn away, as one friend of mine described it. But a person came up to me at yesterday's uh, dinner, offered his condolences, and the first thing he said was, I envy you for the time I had with my father. And that is how I think about it now. And as my mother mentioned and as my sister mentioned, I'm incredibly grateful that I had the 37 years that I did with him. <clears throat> Dad, I want to thank you. You've told me many times how proud you are of me, of Don and Orly. We're really proud of you. And I want to thank you for one more thing. With all the people that you've touched, all the people that you've heard about today, all the people that sent notes, all the people that came through our house, uh, during Shiva, you created an extended family for me, Don, and Orly. From your colleagues here in Princeton and around the world, from Jerry Ostrich or Peter Goldreich, Scott Tremaine, Ed Witten, Nadi Seiberg, Juan Maldacena, Freeman Dyson, Jim Gunn, Rich Gott, Ed Groth, Bogdan Pachinski, who I think is here today, um, and many others, from your former postdocs and students, Andy Gould, Avi Loeb, Ellie Waxman, Bill Press, Sarah Seeger, Ray Sonyera, who um, I discovered this morning that in my, uh, was disappointed that when I wrote my article for Byte Magazine in middle school, middle school, I left him off as a co-author. <laughs> Sorry about that, Ray. David Spurgel, Charles Alcock, who I haven't seen in probably 30 years. Uh, Carlos, uh, an incredible family. The trustees and institute staff that my father spoke of so highly all the time. Jim and Elaine Wolfenson, uh, Leon Levy and Shelby White, Rick Black, Charles Simone, Rachel Gray, Alan Rao, and many, many others. And this institution, the Institute for Advanced Study, which I think you, Dad, have really helped shape. I love this place and everything it stands for. <clears throat> so I want to thank all of you for uh, coming, for the sh support you've shown to me and my family for the tribute, for the many kind words uh, you've said about how my father has uh, influenced you. <clears throat> and I want to end by saying a month ago, I was here at the 75th anniversary tribute to the IAS, where Freeman Dyson, and I want to thank you especially, Freeman, for bringing my dad to the Institute. <clears throat> Freeman, uh, at the 75th anniversary 
Tribute gave an after-dinner speech on the history of the natural sciences at the Institute over the last 30 or 40 years and concluded with, astronomy is here to stay, biology is here to stay. In what my father has instilled in me and in so many of us, the integrity, the caring for people, the enthusiasm, the tremendous willpower and persistence, the humor, the search for the truth, my father's legacy lives on. In how my father has changed all of us, I'd like to add one more thing to Freeman's list. John Bacall's legacy is here to stay. Thank you all for coming.